Hey there, welcome to D&D Daily. My name is Sage, and today I'm going to be doing a blind stat block reading of the Crystal Dragon stat block from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. Let's get into it. Shimmering with radiant energy and brimming with life, Crystal Dragons enjoy an innate psionic connection to the positive planes that suffuses their body as well as their personalities with light. Though they prefer to live in desolate, frigid regions, many of them are among the friendliest of dragon kind, nurturing and optimistic. When they hatch, Crystal Dragons have dull gray scales with a few white or clear crystalline points allowing the wormlings to blend into rocky terrain in the face of danger. As they age, their scales turn snow white, then slowly fade to transparency. The oldest crystal dragons have scales of perfect clarity that bend and refract light, sometimes making them difficult to see clearly. The radiant energy of the positive plane shimmers in crystal dragon's scales. It glows like starlight between their bodies and the spines and horns that hover close to their heads and backs. These horns shift with the dragon's mood, bristling with anger, lying back with fear, or suspicion and rippling side to side in side to side waves with amusement or joy so we're seeing some some early connections between the different gem dragons it seems like all of them have those floating spikes that move with their moods as well as they tend to be more isolated many crystal dragons study the stars recording their observations of the night sky and tracking the signs written in starlight they read these signs as omens, giving them glimpses of what is to come, and they eagerly examine the potential futures of any creatures who come to them in peace. Crystal Dragon's connection to the radiant forces of the positive plane fosters a nurturing and optimistic attitude in most of these dragons. They sometimes adopt the abandoned eggs or hatchlings of other dragons. Many a white wormling has been raised in the caring environment of a crystal dragon's lair, but they fiercely oppose destructive forces in their home territories, which sometimes leads nearby frost giants and white dragons to put aside their mutual enmity to hunt them. So there was a lot of st storytelling right there, specifically between the, the giants and the white dragons coming together to go fight the crystal dragons because crystal dragons oppose destructive forces. So that could be kind of a cool sub-story somewhere in a arctic setting. Could be cool. For their treasure hoards, crystal dragons prize diamonds and baubles that refract light. Collections of prophecy, works on astronomy, and star charts. When it comes to magical treasure, they seek items and spells that predict the future, create or manipulate light, or channel positive energy for healing and nurturing. So yeah, they're basically a divination dragon, a light positive divination dragon with healing. That's kind of their, their thing that I'm getting from this. We'll see if the stat block reflects that. Crystal dragons dwell in cold regions when they construct ice and snow structures reminiscent of castles, but open to the sky. Glittering crystals scattered around their lairs glow with gathered starlight, and caves or tunnels beneath the ice and snow provide protected areas for their hordes. They use their burrowing ability to dig blinds and secret passages throughout their lairs, allowing them to move easily and potentially unnoticed. The challenge rating of legendary crystal dragons increases by one when it's encountered in its lair. Their three lair actions are 1. Beguiling Whisperer. The dragon telepathically whispers to one creature within range of the dragon's telepathy. The creature must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom saving throw or be charmed by the dragon until initiative count 20 on the next round. A creature charmed in this way obeys to the best of its ability any command the dragon issues that isn't directly harmful to that creature. So that is the same as it was for the amethyst dragon. So maybe that's going to be consistent throughout all the gem dragons, and it's it's a really strong one. It's good for them to have. Ice Passage. The dragon can open a passage through a wall of ice or snow that is up to five feet thick, creating an opening up to 30 feet wide and high. That one's pretty interesting. That's a unique one. I've never seen anything like that. Like, I've seen walls come up, but not passages be open. This one would take, like, getting your lair for the your crystal dragon really drawn out, and then you can do, like, I would plan to have some extra escape routes using this one to, like, create uh, even a layered boss fight where it's like you guys start out in kind of an advantageous territory against this dragon, but then it uses its lair action to open up a new area and then go into it, and then that new area would have more advantages for the, the crystal dragon. Something just popped out at the top of my head. The last one is Starlight's Gleam. The dragon chooses a point it can see in the lair. Gleaming starlight radiates from that point to fill a 10-foot radius sphere with dim light. Each creature other than the dragon in that area, when the light appears, must succeed on a DC 15 dex saving throw or take 2d12 radiant damage and be outlined in the glow. Attack rolls made against an outlined creature have advantage and the creature can't hide or benefit from being invisible. The starlight and the glow around any creature fades on initiative count 20 of the next round. So it's fairy fire. 
DC 15 dex fairy fire with a damage on top of it. Uh, just solid. I think normally you're going to be balancing between Beguiling Whisper and Starlight's Gleam unless the Ice Passage you have something good planned for it. To my favorite part, their regional effects. Clear skies. The skies above a crystal dragon's lair remain clear and free of precipitation unless magically altered. Winds blow lightly, posing little threat to those approaching the lair, and visibility is the best possible for the time of day. So that makes me think of like a port um, that, you know, where bad weather could ruin the ships. It could make the, the waters really choppy. So having nice weather in a port would be great. Um, I'm thinking like that would be bad for farming because you need rain, right? I guess I said light precipitation. So maybe that would still be okay. Nothing else is really coming to mind. Maybe birds and trees and whatnot would want to be around this area because their trees would always be safe from the winds and, and storms. Moving on though, crystal perfusions. Plentiful quartz crystals form in natural stone within six miles of the lair, particularly in places where natural light can shine on the crystals. A lot of quartz. Again, that would be great for traders. That would be great for craftsmen and I could see trading guilds monopolizing it. Uh, so, and again, we're seeing some similarities between the uh, the other dragons there that I think all of the gem dragons are gonna have some sort of um, mineral that they create around their areas. Positive energy. Any creature that finishes a long rest within six miles of the lair regains two additional spent hit dice. Well, that's kind of nice. So it's just a nice place to be. That's how I read it. Uh, yes, that's the mechanic, but for the people just living in that area, it would just be a nice place to live. People, it would be very popular, I imagine. So I can see the crystal dragon being near like the main metropolis of an arctic region and by being near a coast or something along those lines it would make it so they could still use ships even though it was cold something along those lines i don't know but just playing with that idea and thriving wildlife animal populations flourish within six miles of the lair ability checks made to forage for food by hunting fishing or trapping in the area are made with advantage that one okay so that one's just like a broader version of what the the amethyst dragon did which is bring fish this one just brings wildlife in general and again we're seeing the parallel so it seems like all gem dragons have some of that psychic stuff going on have those moving um, spikes has an effect on the wildlife has an effect on the crystals being created so we're seeing the parallels here and all of those speak to me of um, main populaces and I think it's interesting that there's an interesting tension behind the dragon not wanting to be known but the fact that their existence makes living for other creatures so much better uh, that's something I would play with as a DM when creating a world that includes gem dragons all right let's jump into the stat blocks I'm not gonna go through everything because there's they're too similar to the other dragons I've been through so I'm just going to point out the things that stand out to me um, it has excellent perception and stealth um, as most dragons do. Um, it has a resistance to radiant damage as well as cold, so that's unique that it has two of those. Um, as far as its movement types go, it has burrow, climb, fly. So I think the big one there is it's burrowing, but climbing is also an, an interesting one because they can kind of go on the side of walls and do some fun things with that. Let's go take a look at its breath weapon. Um, takes a bunch of damage, uh, constitution saving throw. The dragon then regains 25 temporary hit points by absorbing a portion of the radiant energy. So it, it buffs itself. So this is a tankier dragon than normal. And it's always going to want to use scintill uh, scintillating breath. So that's a really good breath to give it some extra tankiness. And the more it uses it, the more tanky it gets. So this guy could even employ hit and run tactics where he comes in with a breath attack, stays for a little bit, and then leaves, gets his breath attack back. So it's basically the more he leaves and creates uh, opportunities to get his breath attack again and again and again, he's gonna be really hard to take down. So that we have some psionic spells as well. We have dancing lights and guidance. Um, those would both, those are very player oriented spells. I don't see this dragon using them too often, although I do like the idea of the dancing lights following the dragon around as he moves through his underground uh, snow and ice tunnels that would light it up and make it dance throughout the caverns. That could be cool. So we have command, divination, greater restoration, hypnotic pattern, and invisibility each once per day. Invisibility just to avoid a combat. Hypnotic pattern is so good. It's so good. Um, that is a combat ending spell and you can take out half of your enemies all at once. So I think it would use hypnotic pattern to, to start out the fight just to basically uh, really hinder their opponents. Greater Restoration, very niche that you'll ever see it use that as a DM character. A divination, yep, going along with its divination uh, type properties. And Command, I don't see it using Command over its attacks, but I can see it using it to avoid combat. 
So you have the change shape and the psychic step from the other ones, both fantastic. Legendary actions, we have Claw, Psionics, and Starlight Strike. So two of those we already know about, so, but let's go into Starlight Strike. The dragon releases a searing beam of starlight at a creature that it can see within 60 feet of it. Tar target must succeed on a DC-19 deck saving throw or take 11d6 radiant damage, so it's just a nuke. Alright, so overall, uh, very similar to the Amethyst Dragon, it's probably going to avoid combat. If it gets into it, it's going to have some really solid tricks up its sleeve. Um, its core of its offense is still its multi-attack. However, Hypnotic Pattern would also be included in its core, the core of its offense, though I see it more often than not just using invisibility and avoiding the conflict altogether. Moving down, we have a change in spells. Let's take a look here. We lose invisibility, and we lose greater restoration for a uh, lesser restoration, but everything else is the same as far as spells go. You get 15 temp hit points instead of the 25, and of course everything else is just kind of nerfed in general, but it's, it's the same creature, just nerfed. Moving down to Young Crystal Dragon, we lose, and even Young Crystal Dragons have Hypnotic Pattern, that's actually excellent. Um, for a challenge rating 5 creature to have Hypnotic Pattern is actually pretty scary, especially with that many hit points and that much damage. I think Young Crystal Dragons, for their CR, are pretty terrifying. Um, what do we have here? We have, we lose command, and we lose divination, and we keep everything else. And finally, the Wormling, where we lose all of our spells besides our two cantrips, which is Dancing Lights and Guidance. Um, they gain 5 temp hit points, so they still get that little bonus there, and they are CR2. That summarizes the Crystal Dragon. Overall, my feeling on it is very, very similar to the Amethyst Dragon. I would use it very similarly in the world. Not exactly similarly, because I see the Crystal Dragon more on, like, a beach coast um, versus the the Crystal Dragon I see more on a, an Arctic coast. But both are kind of coastal creatures to me that avoid conflict um, and are really powerful when pushed to the edge. And on the next episode of Blind Stat Blocks Readings, we're going to be jumping into Deep Dragons. Hit that subscribe button because you're not going to want to miss it. See you on the next one.